All right, I think I just found it. So everyone should now get an alert that I'm recording any second now. I, I see the recording on, on the top uh, part of my screen. Uh, okay, so yes, just to kind of reiterate some of the learning goals for today's workshop. Uh, hopefully after you leave, you'll be able to define the robot, the different parts of a robot and the control of them. Uh, we'll have a small introduction to some of the electronics in your Hattabot and you should have a built mobile robot to find after this uh, session. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Carlotta. So I, I really love the question of what is a robot, and I'm really glad that I get to introduce my description of one because I tend to be very broad in uh, what a robot is. Um, but so traditionally, robots are these mechanical structures that can function somewhat autonomously. And um, the word robot specifically became popular in Prague from the first performance of uh, Karl Kapik's play RUR for Rossum's Universal Robots. Um, and so this was a socialist story uh, where robota meant menial labor from 1920. And, you know, today we see a lot of different robots in our, um, in, even in our homes or in, you know, sci-fi or uh, manufacturing. And so sometimes it can be hard to distinguish, okay, what is a robot? What isn't a robot? Is an autonomous vehicle a robot? Is a drone a robot? Is your remote control car a robot? Um, I think sometimes these sort of uh, sort of challenges of defining exactly what a robot is can just become a rabbit's hole. Uh, but one of the things we can usually try to help focus are what is a robot is think about what does a robot do or um, what do we want robots for? And so this is a, a term that uh, Carlotta introduced me to, which is the three Ds for robots. And robots are ideal for jobs or tasks that are dirty dangerous or dual. And I, I know that uh, Jasmine talked about her work uh, and thinking about where where does AI exist alongside robots? And I think, you know, as a roboticist, it's great to keep in mind this, we want to try to create robots that can eliminate these sort of dangerous tasks, very dirty or dual things that are literally backbreaking work. And um, if we kind of keep that in mind, we can work on creating systems that are, are helpful and useful. Um, today's workshop, uh, I don't quite know if we're able to use a Hattabot to eliminate the dirty, dangerous, or dual tasks. I think it will be something fun and we'll get to learn some of the concepts for how to eventually create a robot for doing these things. Um, and so we'll talk a lot more on how to uh, build it, what are its components, but you know, one thing I do want you to leave this workshop knowing is that every robot is, you know, you can be a robot if you want it to be a robot and they all are very different. They'll have very uh, broad sort of um, ways they can be used. And so uh, we do enjoy trying to do this work though, to try to eliminate the dirty, dangerous and dual tasks for people. And this is a very cute rosy robot. <laughs> cool. So moving on to, you know, what are robots classically made of? Usually when people think of robots, they think of these cyber physical systems that are somewhat autonomous. And um, so it has some sort of body and that body, uh, it might have a brain or something that makes the body move. Uh, when we look at um, different robots, we have a taxonomy of language to describe them. So for example, sensors are things that robots can use to perceive the world. Uh, that could be like a connect sensor, or it could be LIDAR or radar or cameras or a microphone. So sensors are definitely the sort of way that robots can get their input. Actuators are the sort of motors or the physical systems that can move or make the, the robot move itself. 
So these could be um, different motors. It could be like if you have a robot arm, it could be the motor that makes it move up and down. It could be what uh, spins your wheels. So the, the sensors and, and the actuators are kind of uh, these, these very, um, the sort of input output functions of a robot. There's also um, effectors. So effectors kind of a specialized term for um, more of the manipulators or what things get to act on the world. So you might have like a robot arm and the robot arm has multiple joints. And at the very end, it might have a gripper. And so usually they'll call the, the end effector, the gripper, the, the actual hand of the robot. Um, and so typically they, we might separate some of our description of what is the actuator versus what is the effector. Um, because the effector is something that you use when you're acting upon the world. Often when we think about how to program robots, we might focus on what should the effector be doing and not so much, you know, what is the full body doing, but mostly the effector. So we might break up the problem into just grasping. Um, and so those are, these are important terms just to kind of establish a shared language when you're communicating with other roboticists. Um, but they, they also tend to be very broad as well. And so all of these different things that we talk about, just the effectors is like a huge body of research. There are hard grippers, there are soft grippers, there are vacuum grippers, um, all of these different types of ways of trying to have a robot pick up different objects. The same thing exists for different actuators. Um, and I, I don't think we got into the brain, but the brain is one of is the kind of the next uh, part here. So how, suppose you have a mechanical system and it has all these things, it has sensors and it has um, actuators, uh, it has an end effector. How do you actually program it? So this is the, the next slide that uh, Carlotta moved to. Um, this is a really great question. And this is kind of where I spend a lot of my personal time in robotics is how, how do we actually you know, if we have the physical robot, how do we get it to do something? How do we get it to be autonomous? And the first thing to know is that, you know, we don't actually always program robots to be fully autonomous. So, you know, there could be a robot that is just moving around, it's doing its cleaning job, maybe you talk to it, maybe you don't, maybe it just is completely running its own thing. Um, there are also different levels, like maybe it's a remote control car, where you're driving your car around. And that's a form of um, uh, ro robot control, which is called teleoperation. Now, again, some people don't like uh, classifying remote controlled cars as robots. Um, and that's fine. I don't really mind if you don't want to classify it. But if you look at the Da Vinci robot, the Da Vinci is a surgical robot that does minimally invasive surgeries. And so this is a complex, um, surgical robot with multiple sort of um, big rods that can go into a person and the doctor can move these sort of uh, haptic uh, devices in a separate area, separate from the person. And it's allowed um, a very interesting new form of surgery because a doctor can micro like have this big microscope on what it's looking at and make broad motions for very very tiny remote um, motions of the robot so it's a type of surgery we couldn't do before and you know I don't really notice anyone saying the da Vinci robot is not a robot but that is another example of teleoperation where a human is you know, very much in the loop of saying, okay, how, how is the robot moving? What we tend to do is want to try to um, move up and down these different levels of autonomy. And, you know, some of it is just, you know, kind of going back to what do we want the robot to do? Um, unless the robot is able to fully autonomously determine what objects to be cleaning up, you know, you might have to direct it, hey, clean up that item. And so that could be more of a, a supervised sort of um, interaction in terms of the robot control. There's also some interesting research on collaborative robots. 
So suppose you are, you know, assembling a car, doing, doing some sort of manual task. There are these robot assistants that go and like help and give you the next tool that you need. And that's kind of a different form of um, autonomy and control for a robot. So I think, you know, in terms of the different, when we think about robots, usually we kind of jump to some idea that we already have in our head, um, maybe because of science fiction, maybe because of previous courses. Uh, but when we actually go to, you know, thinking about how do we program a robot, uh, we do need to talk about what is the level of autonomy. Um, and in today's class, we're going to program or we're going to assemble a Hadabot. Oh, here's my Hadabot robot right here. And so this one, um, the first uh, sort of type of robot control that you'll do with it is teleoperation. One, um, I don't think we'll get to it on today's workshop, but uh, in the second or I think third one, what will happen is you'll be able to program it and tell it with your web browser how to drive, go forward or right or left. It also has um, odometry and wheel sensors so you could do more of a uh, autonomous control, maybe you could figure out how to program it to do like a different sort of dance. Um, but so again, when we talk about robots, we have this level, this sort of uh, language we use to, to try to make sure everyone's on the same page when we're programming them. Let's see. All right, so I think I will get to pass this off. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the electronics that go on in your robot. Um, so, um, so Jasmine and I are gonna tag team this, um, this part of the lecture. So yes. I'll let her jump in. I'll, I'll, I'll do the lecture, but let Jazz jump in whenever she sees fit. I hope Jazz is an appropriate nickname because I do give people nicknames without their permission. I do apologize. Oh yeah, all the time, all the time. People do it all the time. So I'm okay. used to it by now. <laughs> so an electric circuit, because a big part of building your robot is you're going to have to do some wiring on a breadboard. I wanted to give you some basic introductory information on an electric circuit. I'm so glad that the quota is here and it's an electrical and computer engineering like me. So this is going to be way too low level for you, sis, but just roll with us anyway. <laughs> so a basic electric circuit is out in your house like a light switch, right? So you turn on the switch and the light on or off. So the way that we do that in a basic circuit course is we use this model here with a battery, a resistor, and an LED. So as long as you have that closed loop with the wire, electricity is going to flow. And the current is going to go from the positive to the negative. And as long as you don't have the LED leads reversed, the LED will turn on. It has a diode in it, so it's like a switch that opens and closes so that current only flows one way. So this is the circuit that we usually show when we first teach people about electricity. What you're going to do when you build your robot, though, is you're going to build this circuit or something similar on a breadboard. The breadboard is also called a protoboard but it got its name because originally people used to actually build circuits on a breadboard. So over here is the exact same circuit that I showed you on the previous slide, where we have a switch here to turn the light on and off. We have a battery, we have the LED, and there's a resistor right here. And all of these wires connected with the thumbtacks close the circuit. So as long as that switch is in the closed spot, the LED turns on, or you can open it up the other way. People don't actually build circuits on breadboards anymore. They build it on protoboards, which are called breadboards still. So what these drawings here are showing with the circles are things called a node. A node is a touching point in a circuit. So if you want current to flow or electricity to flow, then you have to have metal, which is a conductor that connects these, these metal pieces so for the current to flow. So what these red and blue markings are showing you is where the nodes are connected on a breadboard. So if you were to open up a breadboard, what you would see inside is these metal prongs and they're connected in these rows in the middle and these long columns on the side. And any element like a resistor or anything else that you put in these, current's going to flow and you're gonna have a connection point. Your breadboards that came with your robot look like these two pictures at the bottom of the page. You have a large breadboard 
and a small breadboard. On the large breadboard, you have a red and blue rail along the side. So what that means is anything you want to touch, you put them in the red row or the blue row. And in the middle, you have the rows that go the other direction like columns. So anything you would want to touch has to be in the same five nodes, okay? So you're given diagrams and pictures to build your robot. As long as you follow those diagrams, everything will be touching, but we wanted to make sure you understood how the breadboard is actually connected to make the circuit pieces touch each other. So here's a very simple example of building a circuit on a breadboard and showing what happens to turn these LEDs on and off. Give me one second because I forgot to turn the volume on when I did the sharing. I gotta go find that screen again. And are there any questions at this point before I play the video? Any questions? So there's the resistor and the LED. In this case, the electricity is coming from the microcontroller. Similarly, you're gonna have a microcontroller for your robot that sends out the signal as well, or receives a signal. So it's an LED, a resistor, and the electricity comes from the microcontroller. but the main thing I want you to get from that is instead of a battery, now you have a microcontroller that can either read in electrical signals or send out electrical signals for turning on an LED, for turning motors, or for reading in sensor data like encoder count or IR data or sonar data. So in your kit, you are going to have the ESP32 microcontroller, which is the brains of your robot. So there's a lot of connection points on here and based upon whatever devices you have connected for your robot, it either sends out analog or digital information, or it will read in digital or analog um, data. So the difference is digital data is just zeros and ones or zero volts and five volts. Analog data is any value along a real number line between zero and five or zero and 12. So based upon those values, the microcontroller interprets them as either a distance from an IR sensor, or for example, if you're looking at that potentiometer that I was turning, it reads the variation in that potentiometer for how much or how dim or how bright to light an LED. So in your um, instructions, you're going to be told which connections to connect things to for your um, robot in order to get the information you need to move your robot and read the encoder. So a motor, a motor is connected to the wheel on your robot and you can have a DC motor or a servo motor. And what tra transforms a motor from DC to a servo is the encoder. You also have two encoders in your kit, one for the left wheel and one for the right wheel. The difference between a DC motor and an encoder is a DC motor is you send out a command, an analog command, and it just spins and it may vary in speed, but all it does is spin. You need an encoder because you want to be able to count and be more precise in your motor, such as how far it's turned, the velocity that it's, it's, it's moving at, or the acceleration. You want this information because when you have a robot, you want to be able to do feedback control to correct for things like odometry error. Odometry error is when the wheels flip or when the robot doesn't precisely get from point A to point B. If you have an encoder, you can estimate where the robot went to and where you wanted it to go to and then adjust the movement commands based upon that. So your robot is going to have servo motors because they're DC motors that have encoders attached to them. Here's a simple example of a servo and I think it has a DC motor as well.
So servo motor, like I said, you can move to a precise location like we're doing here with the potentiometer and the servo motor. Whereas if it was a DC motor, it would just spin and you can't stop it at a certain location. I can't remember if I put a DC motor at the end of this or not. So I'm gonna try to forward it up a, a little bit. That's actually a sonar there. You don't have a sonar in your kit. That's something that a lot of robots have on them for distance sensing. So this one, I'm showing that the sonar sensor is um, actually affecting the light. Yeah, I don't think I had the servo motor in this one. So I'm gonna forward this a little. Notice there's sounds. I feel yeah. like at some point you can classify the the sort of motor just by the sound. Yeah. <laughs> or um, also and, what's wrong with it. If you break a servo, it will make this like really fast spinning yeah. sound. <laughs> Absolutely. Were, were there any questions so far about any of the, uh, the parts in particular? And remember, you can always type in the chat if you're shy and don't want to ask out loud. That's what I do with my students. Blink or blink twice if you have a question, but you don't want to ask in front of your buddies. <laughs> okay, because I know um, when I first started learning robotics, one thing that helped me, uh, you know, kind of make sense of, you know, all these parts coming together, uh, you know, Carlotta mentioned circuits and, and you know, having the microcontroller uh, similar to as a, as a brain. And one thing to kind of compare that to, that's probably one of the most um, efficient systems that we're modeling robots after is the human body. You know, our human body is a is a full circuit. Uh, we have um, a sensory uh, components or modalities like touch, taste, eyesight, uh, and um, our auditory senses. And uh, you know, all of that information gets fed back up to our brain, which is the microcontroller of the other robot, right? And as far as uh, these signals that get processed back out, um, and we call them efferent signals, uh, they get processed back out through our central nervous system uh, to control our motor capabilities and how we move and uh, how we um, physically interact with our environment. So if you ever get lost with, you know, maybe I'm um, teaching what are the components of any robotic system, just remember the human body and, um, and how you can go about that. And um, also, you know, in comparison to, you know, these motors and encoders that Carlotta just mentioned, um, there are also other robots out there um, doing motor processing um, in a variety of different ways. Uh, one example is um, with some robots that I've had to work with in the past called neuro robots, which are robots that behave as if they have a central nervous system. So they do a lot of processing um, with neural uh, information as if you and I have them. Um, so the modalities that we work with are analog information, like Carlotta just mentioned, where it's just very um, continuous. It's not as discrete like a, a light, uh, on, a life, on and off light switch, so to speak. Um, so uh, just be mindful that, you know, the basic components, you have your sensory information, your microcontroller as a brain, and then your output and um, the circuitry goes along with that. And it can get really fancy, but you know, just remember the, the, the basic fundamental pieces there. Thank you, Jasmine. One thing I do when I teach my students is I tell them that the intelligence of your robot is tied to the quality and quantity of the sensors. So for example, the less sensors you have on your robot, the closer it's going to be to just being a remote control car or teleoperated, right? Because if you don't have any sensors, you don't get any feedback from the world. So it can't have but so much level of intelligence or control. Even if you want a basic obstacle avoidance robot, it's either got to have a bumper or IR or sonar or something to be able to avoid obstacles. So the more sensors and the different type of sensors you add, it's almost like the more intelligent or the more interesting things you can do with your robot. So next is our motor controller board. The motor controller board is because typically the current that comes from a microcontroller is not enough to power boards or power a motor. Motors need a, a large startup current. So you're normally gonna have like a motor controller board or an H bridge or something like that 
in order to manage the signals to and from the motor and also to amplify or get you enough current or voltage to get it spinning. So you also have a motor controller board in your kit that you're gonna wire up. And based upon adding the operating voltage in the ground and the commands on the input speed and direction, this dictates whether your robot is moving forward, backward, spinning left, spinning right, pivoting, et cetera. So here's a basic example of a robot where we're sending different commands to make the wheels move and the lights in, are representing forward, left, right, and reverse. So this is a DC motor. And notice on the DC motor, it's not stopping anymore like the servo did. It's basically just spinning and I can control the speed or direction of which it spins, but I can't make it stop at precise locations anymore. So that's what an encoder would do for you where you can now measure based upon light and dark transitions, how far um, or the speed or acceleration. So this is the DC motor. This is the motor that your robot has in it, this kind of thing, but it has an encoder attached to it. So now this, it's just spinning and not spinning um, at various speeds based upon the amount of light. That's a photoresistor I'm touching there. And now I'm teleoperating this robot using my keyboard by sitting in command. So that's whether they're, it's going forward or backwards or spinning left or spinning right. A very basic robot. It's a very cheap robot, as you can tell. But it's doing random wander, um, and it also does obstacle avoidance with the sonar. So that's what I'm showing here, is that when it detects something by the sonar, it's trying to avoid it. So you'll see the wheels change direction, trying to back up from the obstacle. And now I'm showing the same thing on the floor, where it's detecting something, and in theory, um, it shouldn't hit, but this is the only sensor this robot has, so it is going to hit sometime. All right, so now we are ready to start robot building, which Jack is going to lead this part of discussion. I know Paige does not have her robot yet. But can everyone else post in the chat how many steps they've made it through? Like, did you get step one done, step five done, step seven? Remember, I gave you some pre-homework to try to get as far as you could. So we're going to start building now, but we want to see where everyone is. So type, I'm stuck on step one, step five, step seven. Laquata's on nine. Angela's on seven. Sue can tell you. <laughs> You better show it, Sue. I want to see this telly. Sue done passed me up, making the instructors look bad. Okay, um, Paige is, doesn't have a robot yet. So she's here just to listen. Um, is that everybody? Did everybody report up out of time? Or a step, sorry. So let's start with the, the lowest number first. So Angela, Angela, you told us you were stuck on step seven. Can you tell us what you got stuck on so Jack and Simeon can help? You said, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? I think you told us that you got stuck on step seven, right? Yeah. Can you tell us what I it is? Because we want to try to help you. Let's see. Let me let me go back. I'm gonna open up the website too. So I can have okay, that yeah, that'll help. Seven. All right. Yeah, let me open up the website. Maybe you can see it. I, I'm not sure, but this is where I'm at. Okay, looking good, looking good, looking beautiful. Um, I'm getting there. Okay, did you have a question for us? I'm sorry. Did you have a question for us? Um, 
I just need help. That's all. I mean, okay. Like I'm I said, gonna, this I'm is my you, first time. So. No, that's fine. We got you. We got you. What I'm okay. going to do okay. is I'm going to walk through these steps and you tell me stop when we get there. Okay. Okay. So, did you peel the sticky film off of the breadboard at the bottom? So that's taking this part off here. You did that. Okay. Check. Yeah. Um, don't stick it down just yet, but you already stuck yours down. So you must be past that point. Yeah. Note the two mounting holes next to the word top. So that's in this picture right here where my cursor is. Jack, you can jump in whenever okay. you want, by the way. Um, so you stuck this on. Hold up your um, robot so we can make sure this is stuck on in the right spot. I hope so. Mm. Hold it vertical for it. Yeah, straight up and down. Um, Jack, does that look right to you? I can't see. It looks look reasonable. Uh, I can't see anything wrong with it. You're you're actually beyond step seven if you got the motor controller on from what okay. it looks like. Okay. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let me see here. How do I? So we think she's past the step seven. My... So what about right oh, here? I don't I don't see this on. Is this on? This part on, Jack? Uh, can we flip it underneath? Can See you flip up your underneath. robot for us, Angela? Right. Oh, great. Ah, uh, okay. So we need some work here, I yeah. think. Yeah, we need a lot of work, yes. Uh, okay. First thing is, is there a way to make the video screens a little bit bigger? Yeah, let me stop sharing. And uh, now, um, I think... Okay, so I think the first step is um, the orientation of your the orientation of your encoder. Um, the encoder boards are they're not on right. So okay. we might want to use this image here. Hold on one sec. Okay. Here, let me. You want me to make you the um the um host so you can share, Jack? Uh, I think that would nuke the recording. It might disrupt Man. It. Okay. All right. So how you how you gonna do this? How you wanna do I, this? I typed in the uh, the image JPEG. So if we go okay. there and let me go share it and then I'll share it. Sounds great. Okay. Might have to be a little scrappy here, but we'll get through it. All right. So Angela, can you see that picture? So no, first thing you want to do is yet. perhaps unscrew yeah. if you want to unscrew your encoder discs you got your okay. encoder discs at the bottom here so, uh, so so take those off right here where i'm pointing with the cursor yeah there's the disc well you might want to just take off the board i'm sorry i'm, I'm using the wrong wrong uh description yeah. here so pull right, unscrew the board i'm circling take this off where the cursor okay. is for both of them yeah, and okay. if you have the discs in there, you might want to take them off. Well, maybe you could just leave the discs on, actually. It's probably not a big deal. So you're going to take this chip off and take this chip off. Do you have a screwdriver handy? Okay. okay. Give me a second. No problem. Okay, and while Angela's doing that, somebody was on step nine. Does the person on step nine need help or that's just where they were? That's just where I am. I got it. Oh, so you're just moving on, Laquatic. So just keep the train moving and then let us know if you need help. <laughs> yeah, I, I pretty much got it. <laughs> okay. Laquata, how long did it take you to get to step nine? Um, Probably 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Oh, that's cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, I started like LaQuata, right before class was supposed to Angela, start. stop listening to Laquata. You're at a different place. Okay, okay I will. doing no comparing. Different place. Yeah, different don't, place. don't, 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 <laughs> please, please don't compare. Please don't she compare. Drones. Don't forget she flies yeah. drones with kids. I take things apart and put them back together all the time. <laughs> it's what I do for fun. <laughs> nice. So don't, yeah, don't compare to me. <laughs> my my okay. wheel started spinning. So, you know, it's, we're all at our own steps of our journey. And, and Sue got her robot moving and Ari and I still trying to get our baby. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't gone back. I can't say my robot's not moving. I ain't been back to the robot. My robot may move if I go back to it. Uh, Ari may have, move too. I do have an issue though. Only one of my motors are rotting. Whoa. Only one of my wheels spin. I, even before that, and I, do, I did have some issues with the build itself. Uh, 
so when I started putting this together, and uh, when I put the, the motor in this uh, little casing thingy, uh, one of them snapped, to, like one of them, one of the wheels went in properly. The other one was not going in mm -hmm. at all. And I cracked the acrylic in the process. So I have to kind of like weave it together with copper. Oh, uh, well, I'm sorry, I missed that. Did, did you get the other wheel to snap or you, you glued no, so it? While, or? while I was putting this wheel in, it was not going in, into the, the, the white port thingy at all. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, it, it just wasn't. So I lost patience and I pressed it and I cracked the acrylic. Oh. Uh, and I had to weave it together with copper. Oh, wire. I see. And the wheel still wouldn't budge. That's when I looked at it. When I was trying to press it, there was some extra plasticky bits. So I had to file it. Ah, uh, it wouldn't have worked anyway. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so it, it, the fit is definitely snug, and there's that section entirely on it where you have to kind of like squeeze it in. Yeah, I like I, I could sense and I could uh, uh, haptic feel the other wheel going in, but this yeah, this wasn't this was a different feel. It wouldn't have worked really. I took a nail file and filed it. That was the only way it was going in. Oh, okay. But uh, now you got to crack a acrylic plate. Um, you know what? Uh, drop me a note afterwards. If you're motivated, you could replace the, I'll, I could re I'll send you a replacement plate and you can basically uh, have a non, non broken robot. I really appreciate that. Thank so, you. No problem. So, Sue, did you get both motors to work? So when you tally operate, does it actually move both motors move now? No. Only it, it goes in circles. It, it only one. It goes goes. in circle. So there's something going on with one of the motors. It sounds like Jack as well. Yeah, maybe uh, I'll send you a replacement motor. Maybe as you as you were squeezing yes, it. I did. I did check the whole thing. You know, I I I tried to debug a little bit, and I I think like uh, I can't find it. It's it's definitely not electrical connections. You know, on the I don't know. Like, what can go wrong? And it's like you know, I is my understanding right that the PWM is going from the microcontroller to the motor controller. That's right. It's uh, yeah. the signal is definitely going from the microcontroller into the yeah. motor controller. So, um, I, I think uh, generally you, uh, all the participants sort of uh, has exemplified a, a point about robotics is there the, the physical aspect of building a robot, even with such a simple robot like a Hadabot, is non-trivial. So uh, you're all you guys working through it and pushing through it is definitely a, a show of grit and perseverance and required to be. It's a requirement of, as a roboticist. Um, I, but I have to say, I really appreciate you know, the instructions. You know, this is this. I haven't built a kit as straightforward as this. this oh, really? Oh, well, and okay. I, I, I built it with my seven-year-old son. It took a bit longer because he was eating my brains. But even then, it was like really enjoyable. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Well, um, for what it's worth, uh, I am in the process of actually revamping all the instructions to make it even easier. And this way allows you to debug stuff along the way. Uh, specifically things like after you put it together, oh my God, one, only one wheel turns, what's going on now? Uh, hopefully that'll be solved with the version two of the instructions. But for your specific problem, um, I think one easy way, one is if you wanted to after this or even during this workshop, if you wanted to say, uh, take some pictures and just email it to the group or um, you know, I don't think it's an easy way to hold it up into the camera for us to see. Um, we could try to, I could try to debug the wiring on the fly and make sure it's you not a mechanical. You can share issue. files in Zoom, but there, there's a file uh, oh, option. So. Uh, if Sue has a, a camera that can try to take photos of the wire, sometimes I find it's hard to take photos with the, of the wires. It can be difficult. Yeah. Um, but we can drop files in here. Okay. Um, the, the, other, the other test is to um, swap the motor wires. So you have one motor wire, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can do that, like between the left and the right. I can try that. That's right. And then you could test. So then if the motor, if the other motor spins, when you do that, then you know it has something to do with maybe the, um, the interface or maybe you misplugged it in the ESP2. It's just another data point. It might not, if it doesn't move, it still might not tell us. Well, if it doesn't move, then it might be the motor that's broken. Angela, how are you coming getting that um, those two chips off? Oh. Okay, they're off. Okay, they're off. 
All right, yeah. Jack, what's your uh, Angela? Okay, so I think the easiest way to do this is to orient it. Let me see. I have like I have three different variations of Hadabots built at various stages for this workshop here. If you grab one of them and orient it in a way that it represents what it looks like, grab one of the chips or the IC boards and orient it in a way that it looks like what you see in the image and or on my screen and align the holes correctly. Then you could just uh, screw it in in that manner. And will I use this one? Oh, so you took everything apart. Okay. Um, so the first thing is, let me see what you have. What, uh, what, what about your robot? What does your robot look like at this point? Okay, so you took the post off. So first thing you wanna do is take that post, which I look at my box of parts here if I have one. You want me to go back to that point in the instruction too? Yeah, that'll be great. Um, it might be actually the previous step, step six. That, oh, that's back on six, okay. Here. So we're talking about step six, that Im the image in the middle here. So it's like this one. Yeah. So you got to so put this post back on here. Right, with a washer in the middle. Oh. So you get a screw and just put it in yep. the hole. Yep. That's a, okay. But you got, you see there's this washer, Angela. You got to make sure you see that washer right there at the bottom, that little silver rim. That's a washer that has to go on there too. Let's see here. And you want to make sure you get in the right hole. Where my cursor is. Uh, yes. Actually, okay. Got it. So, so there's about a there's a whole bunch of holes. The easiest make sure you just pattern match the right hole. Okay. Okay. Let us know when uh, when that's through. You yeah. actually don't even need a screwdriver for this. You can if you hold the screw with your finger, there's reasonable amount. You know, we're not torquing this thing so that it can handle any sort of significant torque or anything so you should just hold the, the screw in and then take the post and screw it in while holding the screw it, it's uh it should be sufficient you don't need a screwdriver i have like permanent cross patterns tattooed on my fingertips from cheating <laughs> So these are the washers right here. Yeah, that looks about right. It's a flat. It's very, very flat. And you're gonna slide one of them on the end of the pointed out part of the post. Yeah. And then drop it in the hole. So going back to Sue, Sue, how long did it take you to finish the robot to get to the point where you got one wheel teleoperating? Uh, so as soon as, I think the first time I put the firmware in, so I I started as a like, completely new Adabot, completely new software stack, that flow thing. And I, do, I don't, I usually like uh, work on a Windows 10 laptop. So I also had the step of the USB Ubuntu Linux booting from USB. Oh, and that worked for you? That worked well? That had issues and I'm writing and oh. I'm composing a list to send back to, like to contribute back saying what issues I faced in that process. The Windows okay. and the Linux thing, there are some extra things you need to, I faced in terms of that took a long time. That was the biggest step. That took, took me like two hours to uh, get that Linux to that. And maybe the firmware, it was quite straightforward. I, I didn't exactly time it, maybe like uh, should, should have taken a couple of hours of not actively involving like the software stack loading, building, all that happening in the background. A couple, uh -huh. couple of hours. Couple of the, hours. Yeah, the first uh, firmware went in and I, when I started uh, on its own, it was just 
going around in circles. With, I suppose because only one of my motors was working. But at the time, I thought it was programmed to go around in circles, like I told my son. That's the initial somewhere, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but then, yeah, then, uh, then I started the teleoperation bits, and uh, there were a few other, I think you know, there were some, I had to upgrade or missing a few packages and uh, Huh. Well, um, so so did you eventually program the ESP32 using the Ubuntu USB stick, or did you do it through your? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that that one one detail. Your host OS is Windows, is that right? My as in the, I am programming it through the Ubuntu running USB, running USB stick. Oh, okay. So you did get it to work eventually. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Well, um, what's your host OS? Like, what's your main operating system that you were using Windows before Windows. before the Ubuntu? Like, why did you choose to to use the Ubuntu USB? Are you using Windows? Is that why, or is your computer you just didn't want to mess with your computer? Ah, uh, so why do I not dual boot? Is that what you're asking? No, no. I I just you chose to use to create a Ubuntu USB to program mm -hmm. the Hadabot. Mm -hmm. Did you choose to do that because your your main computer at home is a Windows machine, or did you just want a separate operating system where you didn't so want the to... main computer that I use? My my personal laptop laptop where I'm doing all this, which I uh -huh. share with my son also, which has a lot of his games. It's a Windows machine. It's a Windows machine. Okay, I see. Uh, my okay. personal laptop. I have a work laptop which I didn't want to mess with. Totally. That's a, that's a dual boot. So I, I could have done it there, but then I didn't want to do it there. So I did it on the personal laptop and it looked straightforward to me. So well, do send me the you sounds like you wrote some issues down. Um please yeah, send it over or feel free to share it uh in the chat or as a file uh, through Zoom. It's up to you. But I, I think see, everyone I would like send to see it, it because I have to console it. This has just been like in you know, a notes here and there. So I make put some sense to it and send it afterwards. That'd be that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll we'll try to figure out why it only goes in circles because uh, you're you're so close. Despite the fact that only half the robot works, you're you're like ninety five percent there. Yeah. So that's I was going to ask that. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure of what pictures I am taking. Are you trying to match the wire colors? So is that what I'm. Uh. So there are two wires coming out of the motor. Yeah. And, well, actually, I take that back. There are um, there are two sets of wires coming out of the motor controller board. So let me take go to Which, this step. So basically, the motor wires plug into the motor controller board. That bit. That what I'm. That's that's right. Let me uh, let, let me pull up something here. So we're let all talking. Let me know, Jack. Up. You need me to change to something. Yeah, I will. Here we go. So let me pull up that image. So I put an image up in the chat for the wiring schematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're in that uh, image, which has a blue frame around it, from the motor controller board, the blue motor controller IC board, from left to right, the wire colors for this particular wiring, your your colors may differ because oh, everyone's wires, they got, everyone has different sets of colored wires, but it's green, orange, black, red, white, yellow. Um, with those, for those who can't see color clearly, let me know so I could use another description. Um, but uh, the green orange is the control wires for one set of motors, and I believe it's the left one, but I'm not quite sure. For for this particular exercise, it doesn't really matter, but just know that the green and yellow, uh, green and orange are for one set of, uh, well, for one set of wheels. The white and yellow is for the other set of wheels. And you notice how at the other end, they're connected to the microcontroller board into via the, the two small breadboards on the bottom. You just want to swap 
the connection. So you want to connect the green where the white is. And let me make sure I got this correct here. You want to connect the green. Right. Okay. Where the green wire connects to on the bottom, you want to connect, you want to swap it with the white. And where the orange is connected, you want to swap it with the yellow. And I know you got to probably take off the top platform to do so. No, I have, I have the. Oh, you have like a, a surgical precision fingers. That's good. <laughs> my, my colleagues call them like the best mechanical tools they've ever encountered because they are so tiny, tiny hands. It, it pretty much fits in all gaps. That's, that's fantastic. Sometimes size, uh, sometimes bigger doesn't mean better. <laughs> I want to make sure I got this right. Okay, and then if you do teleop now, uh, you might have to power up your software stack and set up, make sure your, your IP address on your computer hasn't changed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, if you do teleop, in theory, the other wheel should turn. If the other wheel does not turn, the, uh, that means your motor is, uh, is, is somehow compromised. Could be from just you, know, you trying to get the, uh, the wheels on, which isn't your fault, by the way. It's uh, just the... These things aren't manufactured to precision tolerances. But um, while you figure that out, and let's pong back to Angela. Well, let's pong back actually to uh, Laquata. I think uh, Laquata, how you how you doing? Uh, Laquata, you're on mute if you're if you're trying to chat. By the way. But I just want to get a status update. Um, did you need a hand with anything or you're all set? Aquata? Or I'll put that in here. Uh, can she hear us? Say that again now. I'm uh, just wondering how you're doing, Laquata. Uh, do you, are you past step nine? Do you need a hand? Do you need? Oh, no, I'm at step uh, 11 right now. Oh, OK. Uh, all right. So you're at the wiring step? Yep. There is a more verbose step-by-step -step wiring instruction if you wanted to go there. I'm, are you using that or you're just kind of eyeballing it with the master um, the wi master wiring schematic? Uh, kind of just eyeballing it. Okay. It's up to you, but uh, the step-by-step -step is uh, is there for you to use too. It tries to just walk through each wire one at a time. So okay. Jack, where, where is that part? Where is that step-by-step -step at? <clears throat> it's uh, at the second section. If you look under the separator, if the instructions above seem too high level and you want a more handheld wiring experience, click here. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. Okay, it. I got it. All right. Well, that's so a good point. Choice. Maybe I should, I should yeah. probably make that a little more visible. How do I go back? Your back button doesn't work, Jack. Oh, right. It actually opened another window. You could just close it. Because it's actually a separate. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. never mind. So take that back off. That's frustrating, folks. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and see, well, see, Jack, I'm a I'm a visual person, so me looking at the wires. That makes and, more sense and, to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got the big pictures. I'm good. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. And your your drones. <laughs> yeah. Drones have made way more wires than this, I'm sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, but yes, good point, Carlotta. Uh, I will try to black out or white out that back button a little more, or at okay. least specify that uh, the uh, it pops up a new window. Yeah, yeah, that that works too. So I'm back to Angela's picture now. She's got to put her encoders back on and then put the um, device, the chip, back over the top of the encoders. That's right. How are you doing, Angela? I'm almost there, probably in three minutes. Okay, take I'm less your time. Than three minutes. Do you get uh, any questions then, or is this uh, pretty straightforward at this point? It's pretty straightforward. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So I think that's everybody. So Paige, I know you don't have your robot, but are you following kind of along okay? Um, I think so. Um, 
uh, everything looks, I'm also a visual person too, so everything looks pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, but all, if I do have questions and when I finally do get my robot, um, from, from the post office, um, is it okay if I can email, I guess? Me um, and Jack, you can email me and or Jack. If it's more building stuff, I'll forward it on to Jack to help you though. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So I'll yeah. make sure to keep in touch with you both. Okay. Oh, thank you. You have the tracking number. I took a quick look. It does look like it's just stuck somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just stuck somewhere. And I, ha I have a couple packages like that. Like, um, I just received a package today that I've ordered about a month ago. Wow. Wow. So, okay. so yeah. Well, we are going to have a follow-up software one, software workshop probably. So ideally, if we could try to get your robot in and you get it all built by that time, that one happens. And that, that was a more detailed discussion of Ross and how the teleoperation works. Oh, that's um, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be looking forward to that. So that should be fun. So hopefully I'll be all ready uh, by that time. Okay. Great. Okay. I think sorry. Sue had an update. Sorry to, yeah, sorry to interrupt. So I tried, I switched the virus over. The other motor is turning. Is turning. It is. Only one. Only one. Uh, is it? It's going the opposite direction. It should go the opposite direction. If you foot forward, it will turn back. If you go back, it turns forward. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So interesting. Um, but the other motor is not spinning. The other motor is not spinning now. As hmm. in the the motor, which was which I think was broken, is still not spinning. Oh. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, right. All right. Yeah, the motor's broken. The motor's broken. A couple of things. The, the motor is likely, 90% chance it's the, motor's, uh, the motor is broken. Mm -hmm. The other things to check is the connection into the, my, uh, the motor controller at this point. You just want to jiggle it to make sure it's not the, the connection that's the... the fault um and also there's the very very unlikely case the wire is busted but most likely it's the motor and it's the same motor you were trying to uh squeeze the um yes do you hear it turning at all let me try no no me. okay um uh, hmm is well in any case i'll send you the replacement and uh, see how that works i think uh well oh, can you hear me yes oh okay you got the i didn't know you took off your headphone um so i'll send you a replacement regardless but in all likelihood it is a faulty motor what is interesting to me is i would have thought the gears somehow got broken, but you could still hear the motor inside spin. But it looks, sounds like it's just, maybe the motor was just busted. So is there a way, is there a way I can just uh, check the motor by its own self? Is there, can I, if I just, what, what happens if I just battery, give a battery to the motor? You could do that too. What you would do is you would, um, inside the, the posts, it's a little more involved because you would have to unscrew the, uh -huh. the motors from the posts on the motor controller. And then you can test that. You could just put that one end on your red battery wire and the other end on your black battery wire mm -hmm. and it should turn the motor. But that's also a fantastic test. Uh, if you wanted to, if you, if you could squeeze your finger in there, pull off that motor controller, and just uh, pull this guy off and then flip it around and unscrew the motor wires uh, for the motor, for the pair that's connected to your broken wheel, mm -hmm. and then put that against the battery. That's a great test if you want to do that now. Yeah, I, I'll try that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Great idea, by the way. Yeah. Let me see what your just, background my was. My son's idea, my son's uh, like innocent idea, which I thought was very cool. How old is your son? Eleven. But his dad is a roboticist. His dad works in surgical robotics. So he has grown up seeing a lot of the stuff in the garage. He's seven years old. And he, uh, he said, mom, take the motor off the motor controller and put it against the battery to test it. 
because all his Lego usually gets into some shape and it gets connected these, to these tiny motors connected to like batteries with cello tape moving around like Lego shape. So it's, it's, a, it's a funny household. That is, it's pretty fantastic. He's very precocious. That's amazing. But I thought it was out of the world. It, it, it was such a simple fix from his simple mind. It was cute. Sometimes the sim simplest solutions are the most non-obvious ones. Uh, so, Sue, if you want to give that a try, go for it. It's a little more involved, but uh, hopefully, in, in the meantime, I'm going to pong back to Laquata. How are you doing? You're, you're ready for step 12? Yeah. Wait, so Laquata, I assume you're ready for step 12 or you're okay? Laquata, I think you're on mute in case you're listening. Uh, you know what, I'll just type it in the chat here. <laughs> okay, and Angela, how are you doing? Good, I'm ready. You're ready. Can I? Uh, can we see it? The maybe upside down view. Just make sure it's oriented in the expected manner. Uh, maybe flip it a little bit more like facing the camera if that's possible uh okay so let's see it's root um do you have two posts here by accident because yeah. this looks like it's sitting very very high too high yeah you i think you got two did you um which is it one post or two posts i can't see it Okay. I, see I think it. you put I think you put these posts on there by accident, which is a lot higher than the smaller posts needed for the encoder disk. The smaller posts have two female ends. The longer posts have one male, one female end. Do you, do you see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I will let you uh, disassemble. Sorry about that. You have to kind of like redo stuff. <laughs> In the meantime, any of the uh, any of the facilitators have questions or comments or want to sort of jump in with anything? Uh, none so far. I'm just kind of um, following along as well. I had uh, one of my other previous robots here. Ooh. Not, it's not a Hadabot, but um, it's a, what is it called? It's from Makeblock. So Jack, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Sure. And uh, I actually bought this when Radio Shack was still open. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of controller does it have on it, um, Jazz? So I think here, ooh, it's a good question. Let me see. Let me look in the instructions because I forgot the uh, the brand of it. Um, what language do you program it in? So I think the, the regular language we use here, oh, so this is our Arduino programming. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, and it's actually remote controlled as well. So you have oh, this. Cool. Sweet. Um, but of course, you know me, I, I want to get down to the nitty gritty code and let it go off from there. So, uh, but it's pretty cool. It has the, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it there, the little two wheels and the, it's like a little Trek tire thing. So did you have to build it or did you buy it assembled? Um, I had to build it and there's oh, two good. modes to it. So there's one where you have the, I guess the, the tire spinning is this way and uh, one mode where you just have two tires in the front and one in the back. Okay. That, so. Awesome. That looks I'm so learning, sweet. Yeah, I'm learning um, from you, Jack, today just to see how I can improve this a little bit better. So uh, the wheels don't turn as great as I would like for it to be, but you know. 
I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> well, the, the treads are always hard because the treads make it hard to deterministically know how, how well it turns versus yeah, it's, two it's wheels. Hearing. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, the, the friction underneath the surface has uh, affects the way the turning velocity as well as the linear velocity quite a bit for treads versus just having two wheels. Um, it, it's not, not as uh, predictable and you have much more higher variance in what actually happened versus right. what did happen. Okay. Are there uh, sensors to let you know how fast the treads are turning or is that just uh, not, uh, did they give that sort of feedback in the kit? Um, not yet. So the only sensors I guess this mainly has, of course, is the, um, your, your sensors here for the, the distance. Sonar, distance sensing. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, maybe I have to dig deeper in the code to find out. But uh, so far, you know, all we have is just the uh, the sonar to measure distance and then turn based off of that. So right. So the you, the only way to localize is is figuring out what your external environment looks like and having maybe a little bit of a, a a map or maybe you don't even need a map. You could just figure out how fast you're moving toward an object. I guess. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But it's something yeah. I'm playing around with, so I'm going to continue working on it. No, it's a fun stuff. And Jasmine, if you if you are interested, ping me if you want to take a look at a Hadabot. Happy to, okay. uh, you know, hook you up. And uh, this way, awesome. it, the um, the main difference from what I see, obviously, between the tread and the wheels, um, the Hadabot does have a speed. It tells you how fast each wheel is spinning, which helps with odometry and localization without a need for um, a map or having sort of a external yeah. sensing device. Um, I would like that a lot, actually, um, to give me a, a better chance to look at uh, these systems from a different angle. And uh, yeah, that would that would be great. Right. Right. So um, yeah, it, it, there's a you know that's the main I guess uh, functional functional di uh, difference. I am planning on putting a, a distance sensor suite, so just a skirt to have not just pointed forward distance sensing, but a skirt around to kind of simulate a spinning LIDAR, but you're not really spinning. You're just sampling maybe five or six different points outward from your robot to figure out wh wh what what stuff is around you. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, something me and Carlotta is, uh, has aspirations to sort of launch as a, a whole course using Hadaba, potentially um, doing mm -hmm. self-local, you know, slam and mapping and all that kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Uh, what uh, grade, grade level do you think you would, um, I guess, target that to? Either K through 12 or college? This is college students. It's juniors and seniors in undergrad in engineering and computer science jazz. Okay. Um, for K through 12, my gut is sticking with Arduino. I think Ross is a little bit too high level for the K through 12 level. Um, I know they can do Arduino. I've done Arduino with K through 12 before. Um, I think Ross is a little bit much for that age group. Okay, so when you guys definitely uh, get launched up with that uh, with that programming for college, uh, definitely let me know. I think I may know some um, university partners who may be interested in um, incorporating that in their. Um, That's in awesome. the chat, I'm gonna send you the um, link to some of my materials so you can take a look at them, okay? Okay, great. You know, Carlotta, I think some of the in introductory material that you ha have will be fit mm -hmm. for K-12. Maybe not K to 12, maybe like 9 not to 12. K. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or it could be Sue's K, Sue's seven-year-old. <laughs> Since she's, right. that I, I kid is just. He, he gets uh, like, you know, the actual simple physical things, like, you know, the motor turns, you know, he can, the, the battery related stuff, he gets it because there is uh, some, some intuition to that aspect of it. But the software stack, I don't know. I just told him it's magic. It's, it's magic. It is magic, magic actually. That is going into his head anytime soon. It's it's not. A, I don't think so. I think in a maybe high school. I don't know. Actually, I have a I have a great story uh, for those. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't nuke the part, uh, participants who's working on their robot. But uh, I was a. Um, a vendor or a, a showcase or exhibitor at Maker Fair um, back at, wow, it was probably like 2012 or something like that. And uh, there's this kid and I was um, showcasing, exhibiting some electronics projects. And there's a kid who taps me on the back and he's, um, he heard me uh, 
say that I broke a LED due to someone flipping the LED incorrectly and stick it into the breadboard. And he says, uh, he's like, oh, I have some LEDs for you. This kid's probably no older than five years old. So I start talking to him and he's like, oh, I want you to show you, I want you to sh uh, see my project. I was like, okay, I would love to see your project. He had this, um, this little dolly that he was pulling and on the dolly. There was a motor that blew, that blew bubbles and the motor dipped the wand into the uh, pool of bubble water, pulled it out. And then he had a fan and then the fan would turn on and it would blow the, the bubbles out. It was, it was really cool. I was, I asked the parents, did you help with this? Like, no, no, they, they, he built it all on his own. So I started asking him these questions. I said, oh, you know, how fast is your, uh, so how does the motor turn on your, on your fan? And he starts explaining to me how there's a magnet inside when you turn the, turn the, uh, um, when you plug the motor in, it powers the electromagnet, which turns the motor, turns the fan. So I said, do you know how, um, how, how fast the motor's spinning? And he's like, and then he looks at me, he's like, well, that depends on the voltage since on the alkaline batteries I'm using voltage drops as you're, as you use the, as you deplete the batteries. And I looked at him, it was just like, wow. Okay. That was like over complete answer. It's very impressive. It just started, modern smarter. By the day. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, on that point, since you mentioned batteries, I have another thing to share from my build experience. So I was, uh, what I was noticing was, uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, writing, flashing the firmware, the blue Wi-Fi connected to the Docker stack thing was always on. And when I switched to my batteries, it was never coming on. It didn't strike me for a good five minutes. It could be the batteries because I was just recycling batteries lying around from toys. And then I went and got a new battery pack out and it just about worked. So I think, you know, the one ESP32, I think maybe there's some kind of a threshold for the Wi-Fi thingy. So it couldn't be anything else. It couldn't be, it, it, it some, could be something possibly as simple as not enough juice on the battery. No, it totally, uh, did you use four AA batteries or did you use a two AA battery pack? Or you just used the, the same four AA battery pack, just different batteries inside. Um, there is also another caveat uh, to the powering the Hattabot. Uh, if your motor controller is powered on, the um, the ESP, and then if you plug in the motor controller first and then plug in the ESP32, uh, that won't boot the ESP32 either because there's limited amount of pins. The, the motor controller uses some pins that can't be powered on when the ESP32 gets powered on. Otherwise, I think it's booting off of a external um, flash system. So you need to power the ESP32 on first and then plug in the motor controller. So that's a, that's also might be a reason why you couldn't power it on too. And then- It was not, and I-, I Oh, okay. Because at the time it was on that- uh, Ah, okay. It was, def it was definitely just the batteries and it's- Okay. But I, I think Sue's commenting on a, a thing that is one of the ways robotics gets really hard. And I feel like with various robot systems, there's always this robotic guru who's really good at diagnosing, you know, if it's a software problem, a hardware problem, just a power problem, a connectivity problem. Like when you're actually dealing with, you know, such integrated hardware it can be very difficult to determine, you know, where the issue's coming from. Um, and so, you know, I, I just hope that we, we try not to get discouraged by it, but look at it as a puzzle, like, oh, okay, I know these things are kind of working, these things are not kind of working. And eventually you, you kind of figure out for that platform, you know, what, what similar errors are, are showing up and you, you learn to, to kind of that expertise of, of which questions to ask um but it's it's persistent even in very um i was working with a, a robot that was built by you know a company you purchase it's very expensive there's tech support for it like one of those robots and i had have this similar issue where it turned out of i i had put it not on the dock correctly so it wasn't uh, fully charged. And that was the issue. It wasn't like any of these other problems that could possibly be the problem. Um, and so it, it is, it is kind of one of those things where I think you, 
maybe you end up with like a checklist of like, is this working? Is this working? And, and you also usually need a friend or a rubber duck to explain like, okay, I think this is what's happening or this is what's happening. Um, but it, it's just, it's a very common challenge with robots is, is just all the different ways that uh, problems can arise. And the most because... common mistake in my circuits class and in my robotics class is circuits class, they forget to turn the power on. Robotics class, they forget they need to recharge the batteries. And when the robot starts doing goofy things, they start changing working code and messing with the hardware. When if they just swapped out the batteries, the robot would have worked. Because they, they just forget to charge them overnight. The batteries start dying and the robot starts doing goofy stuff and they start changing working code. What this code worked yesterday? Well, then don't change the code. Change the battery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, my uh, the reason I noticed this was because uh, it was it was just like a debug. It was powered on from USB, and the Wi-Fi like the Wi-Fi was on. The moment it went off the USB, it was off, and I couldn't. I really thought like you know it's just a, possibly a power issue. Oh, that's great! It's, uh, th as I mentioned before, the simplest solutions sometimes are the not the most obvious, so yeah, now we all know. You're right, you're right. I mean, that is very true. Um, you know, like, yeah, like we've been saying, um, robotics combines several different fields. So um, first of all, that idea of being able to, you know, troubleshoot on the different levels. Um, but then, Talking about very simple solutions, I found that, for example, when I'm working on something in the lab and uh, maybe I just made a change and it's not working, um, sometimes it's as simple as restarting your system. Um, so now, I mean, for a while, you, would, you made a change and it's not just working. And you thought this was the change that was the solution. Um, and... <laughs> Like Carlota was saying, rather than continue, you know, messing with the code, sometimes it's as simple as changing the battery, restarting your computer, and everything works. <laughs> yep. It was uh, funny. My um, my son is uh, learning to code. He's he's in third grade, eight years old. Not as precocious as yours, Sir. You know, he's uh, um, but he was. Um, I heard him through distance learning in the other room he's talking to his teacher through zoom that uh the teacher's trying to explain to the class that it's being frustrated is comes with the territory of coding and engineering and sometimes the the, the exercise is to calm yourself down and try to in a procedural manner figure out what the problem is and then he he basically unmutes himself and he starts telling the whole class it's like yes my dad codes and he gets frustrated a lot and sometimes uses very adult words to express his frustration <laughs> he's like threw me under the bus <laughs> oh wow that's so observant that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find it funny, Carlotta mentioned, you know, if the code was working yesterday, swap out the batteries. I had the opposite problem where I got my code working on a dead battery. And so when I swapped out the batteries, the robot went far too fast. Oh, that's true. That's interesting. <laughs> oh. So I had to like, if, if you get your code working and the robot's dying, that's also a problem. Yeah. Uh, we had the funky. problem where, where students will will do the lab in their dorm room and get everything working and then come to class to demo and it doesn't work. And I'll say, well, does your dorm room have carpet? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, the robots are calibrated for your carpet. They're not gonna work the same on the floor, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you gotta think about things like that. And these are the sort of the various different parts that, you know, roboticists have to think about um, when you're bringing together a project. Uh, being able to keep some of those things in mind uh, is really it's part of what makes the field both you know complex but also fun when you get it working the payoff so to say you know exciting to do amen on that note um how is everyone doing angela did you uh i don't know Okay, we're we're so 
the posts, these posts you're using, the the brass guys. Yeah. I think you're using the long ones. Uh -huh. Well, how many are there? Uh, like uh, each one, is it just one there, or did you stack no. two of them? Here's. Here's one, but that the length on them on yours is yeah. really long. Your yours is sticking out to about here versus down here. So I just so, use the short ones. Yeah, you have you have to use the short ones. The short ones are the those are the right ones. So, so you need it, to. So Angela, if you look at Jack's hand, hold up your robot, Jack. So Jack's hand on the other side is where the long, long ones go. So Jack's got the long ones on the other side. Yeah. So it's the short ones you want on the bottom and the long ones are going to go on the other side where Jack's hand is. Okay. Let me see if I can get a better angle right. here. Give me five minutes. <laughs> we got five minutes. No problem. Why, why do you, before you put the, um, before you put the encoder board on, show us the post and we'll give you a thumbs up and thumbs down okay. to make okay. sure you got Great. the right post. All right. Laquata, how are you doing? You're, are you? So you're on mute, by the way, so I can't really hear you. But uh, let us know if you're doing okay. I suspect she already made her robot fly. She <laughs> added some drone wings to it. It's not flying yet. <laughs> Maybe, yet. you know, not a little yet. bit later, I might put some propellers on it or something. <laughs> That would be awesome. Those drone wings. <laughs> uh, how are you doing though? Are is uh, going well? Any questions? You need any moral support, technical support? Oh no, it's going pretty good. I think this would be a good um activity for our engineering ninth grade students. So we might be trying to um talk about something for this summer. We have a virtual summer camp with the um, school system. And they've mm -hmm. asked me about working to do programming and robots this summer. Mm. So I think this would be a pretty good activity for them as far as um, robots. Because I'm getting tired of the VEX robots. <laughs> I see them one more time. Yes. Uh, what I like, Next? what I what do like. Robot? Sorry, go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, oh yeah, the, Dex, the, the DEX robots. I never heard of those. DEX. D-E-X. They okay. use them for... Um, uh, first, was it fro first robotics? Yeah, first robotics. Uh, I was I saw them for the first time in the competition yeah, last year, I think. Know, that I was the job. The for you for that. Okay, thank okay. you, thank you. This one, all right. right? Yeah, I'm so tired of them. You're looking good. All right, sorry, Jack. Go ahead. My oh, no, I, I, Laquata, we should definitely. If there's any way I can help with your efforts, uh, we definitely connect and. Okay. More kids building robots, the better. Um, Angela, let's see. Sue, did you get to try that, just putting the motor in the battery? Yes, I did. And uh, as a control, I checked out the motor also. The broken motor is broken. The working works. The, uh, so I, I missed that. The motor is broken. So the broken one, that doesn't turn on just with the battery. No, it oh. still doesn't turn. As a control, I tested the other motor. That oh. turns. Okay, so you knew it wasn't the battery. <laughs> okay, so um, I will definitely send you a replacement motor then. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, no problem. I'll send you two just in case. Maybe just an extra hat of bot. That way her and her son could drive them around. <laughs> in a swarm-like manner. I can give him the broken one and take the new one, yeah? <laughs> oh, we don't have to be that harsh. <laughs> No, no, it's of... fun to be able to learn, you know? <laughs> Frustrate him with just one motor. Yeah, and an uh, underactuated control that. system. The son will have a, a <laughs> very hard time learning how to, to drive that one. But if he solves it, then, you know, he's ready for most robots. And uh, Angela, you're... Uh... I'm almost Progressing. There. All right. Um, Paige, do you have any questions? Again, I know you said that you were doing okay, but um, we sort of uh, move forward a couple of other steps. Maybe you flip through some of the instructions. Um. Yeah. I've uh, until I like get my hands on it. Um. 
I'm sure I'll have like a ton of questions when I actually um, get get a hold of the robot. But um, I believe um, uh, Carlotta uh, brought up a great point that I was actually going to ask about um, because I guess when everything is assembled and we make sure everything's working, um, I have access to uh, hardwood floors and carpet. So I was like, oh, is there, you know, how much do we have to account for that and and the friction um or is there a sensor that we just have to adjust um so uh I was just about to ask about that <laughs> so uh so page the the for the Hattabot it doesn't move very fast and it's got a reasonable amount of weight from the battery pack pushing the the wheels down into whatever surface there is assuming your hardwood isn't waxy slick mm -hmm. They both should uh, be be adequate. Um, there shouldn't be any issues with either surface. Oh, well, I should say that. I'm assuming your rug isn't one of those really fluffy, looks like cornfields type of rug. Mm -hmm. If it's just a, a very, very short type of felt rug, then they, they both should be a, roughly equivalent in terms of, in terms of um, capability for the robot. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, I think that's just like one of my main questions because I was just thinking about that. I was like, uh, <laughs> should we have to account for how much friction is, is do the right. wheels have to adjust to? Or? Well, the, the, main, the main issue with friction is slippage. So there are wheel sensors. The encoders detect how fast the wheels spin. But if you had, say, a very, very plush carpet where there wasn't the wheels can't get enough purchase or any friction, then the wheels will spin and the robot will actually tell you that, oh, I'm going whatever, half a meter, one centimeter per second or something like that. But you're actually not going anywhere because the wheel is just spinning in place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with that said, uh, in, as an advanced capability, uh, that is uh, the, the sensors, the sensor setup for the current Hattabot that you guys have, which is really the base kit. With the future range sensing sensor, where you can shoot out distance sensing capabilities, you can actually detect the slippage as well. Because well, what happened is your wheels are spinning, but your range sensors say that nothing is changing in your environment. And you can deduce that perhaps the robot is just spinning in place and it's not really doing anything. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Mm -hmm. And um, for a self-driving robot, like a, a car, they additionally, they have GPS, GPS signals to let them know as well. So let's say you're on ice and you have a Tesla or some other one of these self-driving cars, the wheels might tell the computer system that you're going forward, but the GPS says you're still staying in one place. And that's how it also detects that it's just spinning oh, in place. Okay, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So while they're building their robots, I have a question for the facilitators. Uh, do you think there will be a, a time within our lifetimes where these robots will have emotions and feelings? I think with AI, they can simulate emotions and feelings. Um, they're probably never going to completely get there with AI and machine learning. They may get close. Um, but you know, I don't know if we're ever going to have a rosy necessarily, like a maid in your house that simulates enough emotion and feelings that you don't like fall in love and with it like in the movies or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's also the uncanny valley where if it starts to become too human, like it creeps people out. So I well, don't they think we're going to necessarily get there. Out. Yeah, they did a survey asking people what, what do they think of robots? And they said, if it looks too human-like, then mm -hmm. um, I guess avoid it. It is really creepy. Actually, hold on one sec. Very creepy. <laughs> so Jazz, to answer your other question, is my daughter has participated in um, VEX and FLL. So she's built both. What's oh, that doing us, Jack? Have you guys uh, heard of this book? I don't know if it's flip, it's probably flip backwards. Life no, we can see it, being the human in the age of artificial intelligence. It's a great book. It talks mm -hmm. about the questions that Jasmine just brought out. Mm -hmm. Sort of, uh, you know, what, what about AI? emotion, AI intelligence, what does it mean in the future of humanity? Um, and uh, it's not, it's not like, it's not sci-fi. Does, does it mention the singularity? It does, it does. And it, <laughs> it, it, 
defines a whole bunch of um, it defines a whole bunch of milestones in AI such that everyone's on the same page, and then it, it sort of dives into the um, the pragmatic uh, considerations of each of them, and it avoids controversial questions like. Um, is it good for AI to have emotion? Is it good for their for some for an awareness in a robot? And it tries to distill it down more into pragmatic, pragmatic considerations like what does it mean for humanity and how does humanity how can humanity deal with some of these um, some of these pragmatic considerations like uh, an AI that uh, decides to destroy the world or help help the world or you know whatnot or the shades of gray in between. An interesting question, though, is they could, and, and this is why I think education is important, educating the people about, which is part of what I do, machine learning and robotics and all of that. Do we, would we really, um, not, I'm not talking about just roboticists, but even the general public, are we knowledgeable enough about what is happening in robotics, AI, and machine learning to be able to tell the difference between actual emotions and simulated emotions and things that are even just hard coded you know because yeah. yeah. you know exactly it's like think of Arthur C. Clarke's um, third law um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic and one way to think about that is that you know if you don't know what is under the hood you basically think it is magic right you know and so it, is, it might be possible to convince a large swath of the population that machines are developing emotions when they're actually not and that's just another thing to think about right? do you know they recently had this scandal where people were do using ai to make um profiles on like dating sites that people thought were real i posted it on the black and robotics twitter where it was like a, a algorithm that was just making generic beautiful people and having people match with them and they weren't even real using AI. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we have about 10 minutes to the end and I know Jack wants to propose um, schedule for our follow on software um, session. So I'm gonna share my screen again so that we can talk about that because um, we're 10 till the hour now. So um, Carlotta, did you want to share this? You said you were going to share a screen. Should I wait for sh screen sharing or should I just propose or did you want to You can go ahead and propose. I'll put it up, but yeah, you go ahead. Uh, so at the end of the session, in theory, you guys should have all the participants should have made great headway into building the robot. Uh, I am, me, Carlotta, and the rest of the participant team is uh, invested in getting you to fully build the robot. So don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, um, probably it would eventually funnel to me. So if you wanted to email directly to me, that's totally fine. Uh, and uh, feel free to do so to help you finish your robot or if you have any parts that need replacement, I'm happy to support you there as well. After you build a robot and get it to operate in a tele telepresence manner uh, using the instructions on the website, you would have in theory completed your the software stack setup as well as being able to flash your ESP32 firmware. Um, the follow-on courses, the follow-on workshop that we would love to offer, um, offer the participants here is a, uh, a ROS introduction to ROS programming um, course after that. Uh, is this something that's uh, interesting to everyone? Um, that's the first question. The second question is we're also thinking about changing the format a little bit perhaps making it a little shorter, one hour long, but perhaps maybe having three sessions, three to four sessions. Is that more preferable than saying doing one big marathon session? Um, anybody want to either type in the chat or feel free to speak out to give me your thoughts or give us your thoughts? It would probably be a Sunday afternoon again, but maybe several, like an hour for three or four instead of one Sunday for two. Hours. Okay. Okay. Laquata, Sue, Paige, what do you think about that? I think that's that'll work for me. Okay. We'll probably merge you with the other group since they're so small. Um, the other group has about six or seven people in it. 
And anybody who wants to come to those one hour stints can just come back to get the coding part, the Roth done. Okay. Okay. It, yeah, okay. that sounds great to me. Sounds good. All right. Any other questions from the participants as we're wrapping up? Uh, I do have one other question for, this is the second introductory workshop that we've done and we're aggregating um, some internal feedback and debriefing notes on how to make these intro workshops better. Mm -hmm. uh, would, how do the participants feel in a hypothetical situation where if you were to take this workshop again, um, would you prefer multiple sessions versus one bigger one? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I'm good with the, I'm good with the one session. I mean, I think the time went by fast. Um, I think the the separate sessions would cause me to to get distracted. And I'll build one day and then come back and be like, okay, what did I do? <laughs> I see. What about this uh this sort of a flip classroom setup where we asked you the participants to build part of the robot or maybe even the entire robot. Uh, before you come to the first session? Is that something which is harrowing or would you prefer to just do all the building in the workshop, in the Zoom workshop? I think building half before and building half in the workshop works for me because I know with me, if you was to tell me to build the whole thing before, I probably wouldn't have but like you told me to build, you told me to build up to a certain step before it made me um, rush to go ahead and build it before, before we got to class versus, um, so, because I don't want to be the only one that's not at the step that we were supposed to be at. <laughs> Overachiever. <laughs> I'm competitive too, so <laughs> it's like, no, I got to have steps nine done because they said seven, so <laughs> Um, I would say building half and um, then doing the rest is it works for me. I want to tag along with LaQuanta. Is it LaQuanta? LaQuanta. Yes, I want to tag along. Tag along with her. I would rather build half. You know, like the first couple of steps, and then when we attend class, you know, the remaining. And where you know, if I get just like today, I mean, I got stuck. I can have help. I mean, we can help. Some assistance. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for your feedback. Um, that's duly noted. And I will hand it back to Carlotta. Do you have, you want to spearhead any other points of consideration or questions? Nope. I am good for now. Um, the only other thing we have, I, I'm going to send you an email about completing our survey for the workshop. Um, we will also be sending out a survey for after Christmas, where I'll ask you what days and times work for you for the follow on workshop sometime in January or in um, probably January, late January, you think, Jack? Yeah. Is that what you're thinking? So yeah. I'll, I'll send you the survey now and then probably after Christmas, I'll email everybody about setting up software workshops. Okay, that works. Okay. For me. Yeah, later That'll January work. for me is good. Late January, yep. Yeah. Late January. Early January is uh, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes, bad for all of us. And um, also, what was I going to say? I think that's all I had. Oh, I was going to invite everybody to the Slack channel. That was the other thing. Yeah. Any questions as we wrap up? Any questions about anything? Remember, you can email me and or Jack, or if you email me, I'll get you to Jack if you have hardware issues hey, uh, in your building. Or software issues. Or software, yes, software or hardware. And Jasmine, Simeon, Ari, any other thoughts? Um, no, I'm excited to see uh, the people here today. Uh, really happy Sue was able to uh, see a, a tweet and, and join in. I don't know how... Uh, everyone else heard about this event um, and I'm really excited we are continuing to focus on kind of the, an adult um, workshop so that people can uh, join and start learning about robots uh, regardless of their current career. Mm -hmm. We have had some requests from other people to do some K-12 stuff. We're trying to make sure we got all of our adult stuff done before we kind of go into that realm though. Mm -hmm. 
And we know there's other K through 12 stuff out there too. Well, I just want to say I enjoyed this session and I look forward to um, seeing how you all progress with the robots and what applications you use it for. Thank you. You're so sweet. We're going to keep you in the loop to help us out with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm here. I'm here. You guys have me hooked on this um, for, for forever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, have a wonderfully awesome Sunday. I will be emailing you the video from our session today as well if you needed to go back over any parts of it. Okay. And be blessed. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.